Thank you. So, great. Evan, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I've been with the city now a little over 50 months. Um, and uh, when I came, Jim Keene, the city manager, asked this question. What can one small city do to advance the sustainability revolution uh, that's going on around the world and, in fact, is being led by cities around the world, not as much by nations as by cities? It's a remarkable uh, shift in focus. And, of course, you know that uh, we are now an urban planet. We're more than 50% urban. That's where we are. That's where the footprints are. <clears throat> That's where the demand is generated that affects all the people who don't live in cities and all the resources that sustain us, the, eco the ecosystems that underlie the, um, the health and well-being of our economy and, frankly, everything that we value. So that's the question. That's the frame that we've been in for the past uh, four years plus with a focus of how do we create the future that we want. Uh, that's really what sustainability is about. It's often focused on, you know, how do we preserve what we have so that it's available to future generations, but I'd like to think of it in a more aspirational way. What's the world we want to live in? Uh, what do we want to create? What do we want to leave for our children or our grandchildren and their grandchildren? And we clearly want to have healthier and safer and more sustainable and prosperous and resilient communities. I want to emphasize prosperity because a lot of people, even after all the work we've done over the past couple of decades, a lot of people still think that there's a trade-off between environmental well-being and economic well-being. And you know, I think most of the people in this room know that that's not true. Um, I know that it's not true, not just from a philosophical perspective that Adam talked about, uh, but from on-the-ground experience working with some of the world's largest and best companies, you know, Hewlett Packard, Levi Strauss, Steel Cakes. Um, and others who are approaching sustainability partly out of a, of, of, of a social and philosophical commitment, but out, all, partly out of a very clear-headed, hard-nosed sense that this is good business, that this is a way to drive innovation and grow profit and build brand and reputation and attract and retain the best people in the organization, a huge challenge for most companies. Uh, and to future-proof the company, to prepare it to deal with the risks that are coming at us uh, in an era that people are starting to call the Anthropocene, the geological era that is affected more by Anthropos, us humans, than by anything else. And this is a time of enormous uncertainty. Uh, and so how we think about risk and how we position ourselves for an uncertain future is a critical part of the task ahead of us. So healthier, safer, and more prosperous communities, uh, but also we want Palo Alto to do, to do its part in facing the climate challenge, in reducing our footprint, cleaning up our own act, but because of the uniqueness of this community, the intellectual resources that are here, the business resources that are here, the financial resources that are here, and the passion and commitment of this community, which has been a leader for a long time in sustainability, how do we inspire by example? How do we as a community of, what, 66 or so thousand people influence the peninsula and the Bay Area of 7 million people and California and the world beyond? So I'll tell you folks, people are watching us. Uh, everywhere I travel, I was just in Europe uh, a couple of weeks ago, people say, Palo Alto? Wow, what are you guys up to? We've heard what you're doing, it's amazing. So that's kind of the frame in which we're operating, where we have an opportunity First and foremost, to do good for you because you're paying for us. You know, I'm paid by your taxes. Uh, my obligation is to help you have a better quality of life and a better future, but then also to share what we learn more broadly. Um, and you know that we're in a very challenging time. Everybody knows this. You know, we're, we're in a pickle. I'm not going to talk about it much, but you know that the world is getting hotter uh, and the weather is getting less stable. Wetter and drier, it confuses some of the people in Washington who say, how can there be global warming if it's cold today? But in fact, what we're dealing with is what, what Hunter Lovins called global weirding. In increasing instability in the climate, less predictable climate. Insurance payouts for climate-related disaster have been growing rapidly. I think they're four times what they were 10 years ago in the United States alone. And so the insurance industry recognizes that this is a serious business issue. Um, and they're thinking about how do they risk, de-risk the companies that they insure so that they can have a chance of being effective uh, in the years to come. Um, 
Palo Alto's got a long uh, history of climate leadership. You know, we, in addition to having a municipal utility going back, what, 120 years now, we, we built one of the first municipal climate action plans in the United States in 2005. Uh, we've just completed, in my tenure here, a new sustainability and climate action plan, the SCAP, that's the acronym on the screen. Uh, that sets out for the city a target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80%, the international target for 2050, but doing it by 2030. Why? Because we can. Why not? Let's do it. Uh, so we have, in the course of that, we've established the first carbon neutral utility in the United States. Uh, we have green building ordinances that are about 15% more demanding than California's, which are the most demanding in the United States. So there's a pattern there, right? California leads the country. Palo Alto leads California. It's a nice game to play. Um, we're now in the process of implementing the first phase of that climate action plan with the 2018 to 2020 sustainability implementation plan. There's your next acronym, SIP. And so what's happened, I'll talk more about that in a moment, but that's kind of taking the rubber to meet the road. What do we actually do with these ideas and how we run the city government and how we serve you that forwards these ideas. Uh, and maybe in the future we'll be talking about a price on carbon uh, and whether a city can actually take a leadership role in that. We're not sure. Maybe something that has to be done at the state level, but it's a question that we're looking at. Um, buildings are key uh, uh, in this equation. Uh, they use electricity and water. They generate what people call waste. They engender mobility, engender transportation demand, uh, which is a big issue for us both in terms of footprint and quality of life. Uh, but what if they didn't do that? What if buildings didn't use energy but generated energy? What if buildings didn't use and pollute water but captured and cleaned water? Uh, what if the buildings and communities we built actually reduced transportation demand instead of increased it. These are some of the questions that we're starting to ask. And one of the keys for this is not just to think about better stuff, you know, more efficient windows and better solar collectors, but to think about systems and the interrelationships of all these pieces and designing at the level of systems, physical systems, neighborhood systems, policy systems, and it's challenging, I'll tell you. You know, I'm, I'm here I am before you as a bureaucrat, right? Um, in, a, in a bureaucratic organization, in a democratic bureaucratic organization, a very difficult combination. Because, you know, we want to have participation and buy in and shared sense of purpose, and that also takes a lot of time to do that. So we're always challenged with can we go faster but really be inclusive? Um, but, you know, the bureaucratic organization is this amazing human invention. It has enabled us to do things at scale that we never could have done as little isolated tribes, but it also compartmentalizes everything that we know. My mentor, Buckminster Fuller, used to say that in the world, there is no Department of Biology and Department of Chemistry. There are trees that have both of those processes in them. Well, we're a bureaucracy, so we have departments of this and departments of that. And I remember a city council meeting that I was at, uh, this must have been almost two years ago, we were in the midst of the comprehensive plan process, which many of you are familiar with. And we were at a, the, the focus of the meeting was talking about housing. And one of the speakers said, well, you know, if we're going to talk about housing, we have to also talk about transportation because where we put the housing affects what the transportation demand is. And you know where the story goes from that. And one of our council members said, no, 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 this week is about housing. Next week, we're going to talk about transportation. <laughs> you know, I wanted to go in the back of the room and bang my head against the wall. I understand structures and schedules and departments and the practical need to be able to focus on a piece at a time. But we have to find ways to do that with pieces stay interconnected. Otherwise, we miss enormous opportunities to create value. So our direction as a city, and frankly, as a state, is clear. We're looking at how do we decarbonize the economy? How do we take the dependence on carbon-bearing fossil fuels and carbon emissions that come from them and engineer them out of the system over time? Uh, we started five years ago with carbon-neutral electricity. Many of you remember that. We used to have a Palo Alto Green program that invited you to voluntarily spend a little bit more on your electrical bill in order to, that we could buy uh, renewable electricity, and we got to the point where 22% of the community was signed on to that program. Tom, you were involved in that work back then at the utility. Uh, and in 2013, the city council said, well, let's just do that for everybody. 
Let's just make it part of how we do it. And so in the first year, we bought Rex Renewable Energy Certificates to offset the carbon impact of our electricity, um, not as a solution, but as a bridge to the solution. First, let's buy down the impact, and then over the next four years, let's expand our renewable portfolio to the point that now Palo Alto, Palo Alto Electricity is hydroelectric and renewable and no fossil fuel. Boom. Great. Two years ago, we did the same thing with natural gas. We started with a voluntary program, Palo Alto Green Gas. A bunch of you signed up for that. And then based on community leadership coming to the city government and pushing us to go faster than we might have otherwise, council said, let's do the same thing with natural gas. Let's buy offsets, which we did. They currently go for forestry projects in our sister city, Oaxaca, and other places. But again, not offsets as a solution, offsets as a bridge to drive down natural gas use through efficiency and electrification to the point that some date in the future, we don't know when, in contrast to electricity, we don't yet know when to eliminate natural gas use uh, in the city. Um, so we've done this. Next step maybe is carbon neutral mobility. How do we get there? Um, I'll show you a slide in a moment to illustrate the scale of that. And then the next is, can we be a carbon neutral city? There aren't any that we're aware of on the planet, certainly not at an urban industrial scale, but could we do that? What would that take? What would that look like? How would it feel to be in it? Would you like getting up in the morning knowing that that's where you were? And the target, as I said before, is 80 by 30, 80% 80 reduction in emissions by 2030. And here's where we are. Uh, this goes back to 1990, the reference year internationally. Um, and you can see the drop in 2013 as we took the green bar out and made our electricity carbon neutral. Uh, small reductions over the years since then. And in 2017, you see a drop in the blue bar. That's natural gas. The, car the carbon offsets kicked in in the middle of 2017. So you see a partial reduction there. Next year's version of this, that blue should be gone. Pretty cool. And you see the piece that's remaining, the standout piece in red. You know what that is, right? Somebody? Hmm? That's transportation. That's mobility. That's, um, well, to, to, put it, to, to put it in scale, I, you know, I said we're 66,000 people here. Anybody know our daytime population? 154,000. So every day there's a net influx of 88,000 people. There's, you know, people commute out from here, but the net is an 88,000 gain. Two to three times growth every day, like a big tidal pulse, speaking of coral reefs. In and out, in and out. And most of those folks are driving, and most of those folks are driving single occupancy in fossil fuel vehicles. Boom. So you're at 75% of our footprint. What do we do? How do we eliminate that? Because in order to get to 80 by 30, Clearly, that's, um, that's here. There's the target. We only get there. We only get there if we transform transportation. And guess what? We can't do it ourselves. We're 66,000 people in a metro of 7 million. So we have to do it partly on our own merits and partly by influence of those around us. Two key strategies there. One is to electrify vehicles wherever possible. Um, and of course, we can't make anybody buy an electric car, but we can hopefully make it easier for you to have one by increasing charging infrastructure in the city, making it more convenient, requiring that new construction provide capacity for that, and so forth. And the second is both within our own jurisdiction and with those around us to um, encourage the growth of what we call mobility as a service, shifting from car ownership to car use when it's needed. Um, how many of you own cars? Okay, good guess. I'm, I'm gonna guess that it's probably for most of you your second largest asset after your home. And how often do you use your car? The national average is about 6% of the time. Your second largest asset sits idle in your driveway or garage 94% of the time. Folks, this is not just about environmentalism. That's bad capital utilization. It makes no sense economically. So what we need to have is cars when we need them. Uh, if I go to Tahoe once a year, I don't really need to own an SUV. I can own you know, like a smart car and rent an SUV once a year. 
Uh, in my case, this is my car. Now I've got a dozen different mobility apps on here that let me deal with Lyft and Uber and Caltrain and AC Transit and United Airlines and all the rest. Um, we'd like to see one app that connects everything, um, that makes it easier to get around and take down that, that red bar. So let me go on to here. So just to summarize from the Sustainability and Climate Action Plan, the goal I spoke about, there are 10 areas of focus. You can see them in the icons on the right, and the key strategies are on the screen. I'm not going to read them all, uh, but clearly promoting efficiency is part of it, making it more convenient not to drive. Um, you know, We're not going to do this by mandates and draconian measures and punitive environmentalism. We're going to do this with better mousetraps, more attractive, more convenient, more economical more flexible solutions for people. Um, we're going to embed sustainability in the operations of city government. Uh, Jim Keene, city manager, said the watchword here is that we go first. Okay? We don't tell you to do anything that we're not doing ourselves. Because if it's a good idea, we should be doing it, right, for, as the city government. And if it's not a good idea, we shouldn't be asking you to do it. It's very simple logic there. And so one element of that is what we're calling default to green. Palo Alto, like many cities of, uh, some years ago, actually nine years ago here, adopted a policy called environmentally preferable purchasing. What that means is that the city government, when it buys stuff, computers, cars, paper, what have you, will buy the environmentally preferable product when it's feasible, when it's economical, when it doesn't cost too much more, when the performance aid is not too bad. That's what was the best practice 10 years ago. Uh, we said two years ago, no, let's just turn that on its head. Let's buy the environmentally preferable product, period, as our basic policy. In the cases where it might be too expensive, or in the cases where its performance may not be sufficient to our current needs, example, um, we can't yet get police cars that are electric or plug-in hybrid. We'll be able to next year, but we haven't been able to. So in that case, we waive the requirement. We're not going to force the police to drive in an ina inadequate vehicle. Uh, we're not going to force um, you know, the, uh, the folks maintaining the parks to use technologies that won't work effectively and safe, safely for the workers, but the starting point says let's do the right thing unless we can't. Very simple in concept, very powerful. Um, uh, next, last on the list is to align our investments to match our goals. You know, where do we put your money in terms of infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, parking infrastructure, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, the water treatment plant? Are we making investments that are consistent with our goals? Um, you may know that Palo Alto has had, since at least 1998 in the comp plan, then a policy of reducing dependence on the private automobile. But we provide free parking. <laughs> kind of a mixed message. How do we reconcile those? And there, you know, there are real reasons that we do that, and there's, and there's political support from some of the community for doing that. So it's a conversation we need to have together to work out those conflicts and find a way to find where we agree or how to grow our agreements so we can move forward together. And, and, and really important in terms of the role of the city, um, Jim Keen and I often talk about the city as a platform not only as a service provider, but as a vehicle that helps other people <clears throat> innovate and develop services and provide services of their own. One great example of that is our open data policy. It's another example of a default policy. Uh, some organizations say our data is private and we'll open it up when we have to, Freedom of Information Act requests or some reason to share our data. Palo Alto says, no, no, our data is open. In the cases where it shouldn't be, personally identifiable information, security factors, and so forth. Where it needs to be closed, we'll close it, but that's the exception. The norm is open. And what that means is that data is available for citizens to watch what we're doing. It's available for entrepreneurs to think about building products that use that data to deliver better services and do it, frankly, faster and better than the city government could do. We're not software developers, but a lot of you are. A lot of people around us are. So how do we facilitate that, provide a platform for that work? Um, 
So that's the scope of the whole sustainability plan. The implementation plan is focusing on four key areas over the next three years. The priority is carbon dioxide and water carbon dioxide for the obvious climate reasons. Water, well, for the obvious climate reasons. Uh, you know, the drought that just ended, my friend Will Sarney says, don't call it a drought because this is a cyclical process that goes on in California forever, as long as we have recorded history. But worse than that, our friends at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena say we're facing what they call a multi-decadal mega drought. Multi-decadal mega drought. What that means is that it's going to be drier and messier for us for the rest of our lives. It's not a matter of saving water every couple of years. It's a matter of redesigning our relationship for the land on which we live and the climatic regime that we live in. This is not just about drinking water. Half of our electric power comes from hydroelectric power. If the rain, if the precipitation patterns change, our energy system is at risk. How do we deal with that? How do we prepare ourselves for not the certainty of this, but the significant likelihood a big disruptive change in our lifetime and in the lifetime of our children and grandchildren. So carbon dioxide and H2O, four focus areas, energy, electric vehicles, mobility, and water. <clears throat> the other matters in terms of city operations and finance and natural environment uh, are still on the table, but this is the focus for the next three years. And here you can see the specific goals. I don't know, are those readable? Yeah, they are. The specific key goals in each of those areas gives you a sense of the shape and the focus of our activities as we move forward. And I have found that it's helpful to think about this as kind of three different domains of action. Um, everybody remembers the reduce, reuse, recycle hierarchy when we think about recycling and solid waste. Uh, well, I think about flows and systems and behaviors. There's the stuff that moves through our community, energy and materials and water, and actually also data and money uh, and people. You know, moving through the physical boundary, there are the systems that we depend on, the building system, the transportation system, the utility infrastructure, and the financial systems, and how we measure and manage our money, and the social systems, and the natural capital and the commonwealth that all this depends on. The natural capital, soil fertility, biodiversity, clean air and clean water, the functions of ecosystems to continually renew clean water for us. All these systems that we depend on. And then third is, is our behaviors, the belief systems that underlie our behaviors, the conversations that we have with each other, the requests that we make of each other, the promises that we make to each other. This is the currency of human affairs, and frankly, it's the currency of business and politics also. Uh, the commitments that we make to each other, the policies that we enact, the actions that we take, and the allocation decisions of where we put our money, where we put our budgets, where we put our time, where we put our loyalties. You know, elections don't just happen every two years. Elections happen every day. You slap a dollar on the counter, you're voting for a future. What future are you voting for? So three domains of action, and here's another triplet, those are the three core moves that we're making in this plan. Part of it is reducing, reducing the use of resources or the resource intensity of how we do what we do. Um, second, though, is shifting what we do, shifting from using natural gas as a heating fuel to, electric, to electricity and electrification. This is California policy, and once again, Palo Alto is trying to stay a couple of steps ahead of California policy. Uh, looking at how do we help people shift from natural gas power water heater to electric water heaters that can be on the grid and can actually be addressable by the utility and be part of the energy storage system of the city. How do we move from fossil fuel power cars to electric cars from using potable water to you know, irrigate our gardens and flush our toilets? For God's sake. What is that? You know, like our grandchildren look back at us and think they were absolutely nuts. Did you guys really use drinking water to flush your poo down the toilet? Like, how stupid could you have been? So we will grow out of that, but we're not out of that yet. So that's a shift. And, you know, shifting from, from um, uh, 
uh, goods and services that are a little bit better to this default degree concept that I talked about. The third, which is the biggest impact, and frankly the most challenging of these, as you might imagine, is the transformation of systems, moving from car ownership to mobility as a service. MOS is the term that comes out of Finland for that. Embedding sustainability in all the operator decisions of your city government and the businesses that live in the city. Uh, aligning our incentives so we're not saying fewer cars but free parking. Uh, and addressing the nexus, challenging for your bureaucracy, the nexus between jobs and housing and transportation. And you know, well, that's not just a bureaucratic challenge, it's a political challenge in this community because we have very strong feelings uh, across our community about these issues. And we have to find a way to, to build common ground to move forward. Um, so as I said, we're, you know, we're a small city in a large metro, so the question is, how do we do this? Where are our zones of influence for making this happen? And I would suggest that there are four. At the center of the circle is the city operations. We more or less have total control over that. And we have you know, statutory restrictions, and we have budget constraints, but pretty much we can decide how to run our own organization. We have a high degree of control about that. Um, we don't have as much control, obviously, over you and your lives, but we do have codes and mandates and ordinances that constrain certain behavior, require certain behavior. It's one of the things that city governments do, building codes being a very obvious example of that. And that's a place where we've been able to have a lot of leverage in encouraging the greening of the building stock in Palo Alto. Uh, some of you know about Energy Star buildings. We are not the city with the most Energy Star buildings in the United States, but we're the city, I think, the, sec the second most per capita in the United States. That's pretty cool. Uh, um, so there's the ordinance piece. Third, the next ring out is the incentives and rebates and education and outreach. This might be financial incentives from Palo Alto Utilities, or might be educational programs run by the library, ways that we can share ideas and share events like this, share influence uh, in a more indirect way. And the outer ring, which again is the biggest influence but the hardest to do, is, is regional and statewide policy. And so as an example there, I've talked about mobility a number of times. We formed uh, last year a manager's mobility partnership. Uh, this is a monthly meeting with the city managers from Redwood City, Menlo Park, Palo Alto, and Mountain View. Uh, and our friends from Stanford, which is not officially a city, but obviously it's a city. Uh, and these leaders meet together once a month to talk about what can we do together to address mobility issues that we can't address by ourselves. Um, one adjunct to that work, we, we were awarded uh, just over a year ago a million dollar grant from the Federal Transit Administration as part of their mobility sandbox program to pilot new mobility strategies both in Palo Alto and in the Mid Peninsula. Uh, so this will include um, uh, improved employee commute benefit programs, first and last mile services so that people whose workplaces and near Caltrain can actually easily get to the train. Uh, and a number of other measures and some policy work. And the hope there, the, the feds have funded this because they see it as an experiment where they can learn on the ground what works and where the cutting edge is. Um, for us, one of the potential upsides is to uh, build a political coalition among Bay Area cities through practical experience together so that we can go together to Sacramento and say, this is what we need that we can't do by ourselves. We can only do it with your support, but have a roadmap for it. So here's the, the, the trajectory and the timeline. You can see on the left-hand side of the graph the reductions to date. You see the drop in 2013, that sharp drop in the line as we elect, uh, neutralize electricity. Uh, we're today at about 45% reduction on our way to 80%. And over the next three years, we'll take it down a bit more. We think to maybe 55%, maybe 60% by 2020 and then on down the ramp for the rest of the decade, um, probably with a new or updated climate action plan in 2020. The, the, the state office of uh, planning and research recommends that these be refreshed every five years, so that's the working hypothesis there. Uh, you'll notice that this shows a straight line from today to 2030. It's not going to be a straight line. That's just simple schematic of the graph. Some of that's gonna go faster, some of that's gonna go slower. It's gonna probably wiggle along the way. Uh, one of the challenges that I've had with my colleagues is folks have said, give me the annual targets. I've said, no, no, we don't wanna to manage to the annual targets. We wanna to manage to the trajectory. Just like any of these sailors, 
you know, when you're sailing into the wind, you're never on a direct course. You're tacking. You go on off course and off course and off course, directionally right, with variation along the way. So that's what will, in fact, happen here. Um, within the SCAP, there's a page that I think when we look back in 10 years may turn out to be one of the most important things that we've done. And it's a set of design principles. Again, I won't read them, I'll let you read them. Uh, but the idea here is that this is the background frame in which we approach everything that we do. And some of my colleagues said, well, we don't need those. Let's just focus on the programs. And this is one of the few places in the past 50 months where I really dug my heels in. I said, no, no, trust me, we need to have this because we're going to get to a point six months out, a year out, or three years out, we're going to have to scratch our head and say, what in the world do we do now? We're stuck. We don't know how to move next. And the guidance is, let's look at this. Let's use this as a roadmap and see what suggestions this offers to us about how we move forward. Uh, focusing on what's feasible, uh, prioritizing on the things that we can do, being really specific about the actions that we need in the near term, but much more open and flexible about what the long term trajectory is going to be like. We cannot define today what we'll need to do in 2025 because the world's going to be different. Technology is going to be different. The pace of change is going to have advanced the game. And so we need to find a good balance between being very specific about certain things. Because again, we need to make good use of your money. We need to plan well and execute well. But we need to be careful about over specifying where it doesn't make sense to do that. Fundamentally, we need to learn to use ambient resources. When we raised this idea, somebody on the council said, what's that? And I said, it's the resources that fall on the city. And the person said, well, there's no resources that fall on the city. And one of the council members sitting next to this person said, well, of course there are. You know, there's the sun and the rain and the wind, and the, et cetera. So that's the concept. How do we do that? Uh, you know, some people think that's impossible. But if you walk outside and look at a tree, that's what it does, you know? We've got 3.8 billion years of open source research and development, <laughs> free, available to us about how you do that in living systems. We need to learn how to do that in human systems and industrial systems. <clears throat> Full cost accounting, measuring what things really cost. Now, this is a place where I'm very proud to say Palo Alto has been a leader. We have a policy going back to 2009. Uh, requiring that in our in our economic analyses as a city, we look at total cost of ownership, not just the cheapest thing to buy, but the cheapest thing to operate over its lifetime, which is better. And a lot of cities do that. We went one better than that. We said, including the cost of externalities. So we have as a matter of city policy to measure and consider the cost of environmental externalities, which should include at some point, hopefully in the near future, the cost of carbon. Uh, just so you get a sense of scale there, California, as many of you know, has a carbon trading market, uh, currently prices at about $10 to $13 a ton. Um, United States government has established a social cost of carbon, currently set at $35 a ton, going to $50 a ton in 2020, which is factored into economic analyses. We've brought that price into, as a pilot project, the economic feasibility analysis for city fleet. So when we're looking to buy a vehicle, there's a cost of carbon <coughs> analysis. It's not enough to flip the decision, but it's, it's in there. If you want to flip the decision, you look to Sweden, which uh, took a very different approach than the US government. The US government did a research-based approach, building from the data from the bottom up to say, what do we think the cost really is based on social impact? Sweden asked a different question. They said, where does the price need to be in order to drive the decarbonization of the entire society. And they said at $120 a ton. 10 times California's price, and California's a leader. And if you look at the Swedish economy, it's actually doing quite well with that price in there. We need to align our incentives, as I talked about before, and we need flexible platforms so that we can take practical near-term steps that give us a place to stand to see what's next, and then move and steer the way we need to go. If we do this well, we unlock a phenomenal transformation in energy and climate. The foundation is efficiency and electrification. That's not just for us, but that's the core of the California Energy Commission strategy for all of us. Uh, right now, we focus on implementing these plans as we have them, embedding these principles into our day-to-day -day operations, 
for me, one of the measures of success when I retire is that people say, well, what did you do? I say, I helped all this happen. And they say, well, that's not that everybody does that. We've always done it that way. <laughs> so, you know, that hopefully we get to that point. And then, you know, some of the next issues are dealing with our existing building stock. I've mentioned our green building ordinances. We're very good there. But those apply to new construction and renovations or major renovations that come to the city for permits. That's about 1% to 2% of our building stock per year. So if we wait for the natural process to play out, it's a 50 to 100 year transition. We don't have that time. So we're wondering, looking, exploring, thinking about how do we accelerate the efficiency transformation of the rest of the building stock. We can't go to you and knock on your door and say you have to invest money to change your house that's not feasible or appropriate. But we're looking at where the mechanisms, both through incentives and encouragement, uh, maybe actions at point of sale, as Berkeley and other communities have done, but our realtors are not comfortable with that idea. So there's a lot of discussion and working out of details to happen. But we need to get to the existing building stock, the mobility issues, which I've talked about a bit, and the relationship of mobility and land use. Do we build more housing or not? We're actually finally starting to, after years of dry spell. Where do we put the house? Do we put it near transit? or near highways, where do we put workplaces? If you look at the maps of the Bay Area, most of our big employers are near highways, not near transit. There's, you know, engendering a problem that we're still trying to sort out. So how do we make those land use decisions in a smarter way? Um, how do we build these principles into our finance and operations? How do we think about consumption? I have it in quotes, because you all remember what consumption meant 150 years ago, don't you? It was tuberculosis. It was the disease that eats you out from the inside, and now we identify ourselves as consumers. Lord, help us. So how do we start being sensible about the stuff that we use to sustain our lives, and how do we build a circular economy where there's everything cycles, and there is no way. Things are designed to be reused, or used for a long time, or be purposed. And, of course, deeply important, I haven't touched on it a lot tonight, is the question of adaptation to the changes that are coming to us inevitably, no matter how well we do. Now, this is the sad news on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We are in for a rough ride here and internationally. Right here, you know, temperatures will rise. That means, in addition to discomfort, that means enormous health issues for our senior population. It means the rise of wildfires. You saw what happened in Santa Rosa last year. Uh, sea level rise, what that means for us is that the bay, the mid-range estimate is that it rises six feet by the end of the century. Six feet. Could be higher. Might be lower. Six feet has issues for our freeways, our airports, our bay lands, our water quality control plan, all the buildings uh, down near their Highway 101. How do we think about that? How do we prepare for that? We don't know how much and how fast we know something is coming at us. And it's not a solution we can solve by ourselves any more than we can solve the transportation issue. If we build levees, the usual response to water rising, all the water just goes to Menlo. And if they build levees, it just goes to Redwood City. If Redwood City builds higher levees, the water comes back here. That's not the answer. The answer has to be a systemic solution that we all do together. Uh, recognizing that preventing climate change is no, unfortunately no longer our only option. We're going to have to deal with the mess that we made in some way. So the vision in all this is that as California leads the country, Palo Alto leads California. And we do that because it makes sense to do that. We do that because we can, given our history and the shoulders that we're standing on and the resources and the commitment in this community. Um, you know, today we have a carbon neutral utility. We're looking at how do we engender more zero net energy buildings, buildings that don't use any more energy than they capture and generate. And where do we go next? Maybe net positive buildings, buildings that produce more energy than they use, that generate more clean water than they use. Um, people are talking about words like resilience and regenerative eco eco economies. There's going to be a regenerative economy conference in San Francisco in early May digging into these ideas. Restorative strategies that don't just kind of hold the damage at where it is. My friend, my friend um, friends Bill McDonough and Michael Browngard are fond of saying, you know, when somebody asks you, how's your marriage? 
If you say, well, it's sustainable, <laughs> I'm going to say I'm really sorry for you. I'm really sorry to hear that because I would want to hear that your marriage is restorative and renewing and exciting and feeds your soul. Sustainable is not, enough, not a good enough goal for us. <laughs> but what would be? What would really capture our hearts and enthusiasm and motivate across the political differences in our community and our state? You know, on the horizon, big growth in distributed energy, which we've got a lot of going on in distributed storage. Not just batteries at the grid and batteries in your house, but your car as part of the energy grid, your electric car. Um, uh, EV 2G, electric vehicles to grid. You're going to hear that word coming up again, which poses you know, really significant challenges for a utility. It really challenges the whole business model that we've been operating with for more than 100 years. We have to figure out how to redesign that business that we own together. Um, foodscapes in urban forests, enormous growth in urban agriculture around the world. Can cities be food producers, not just food consumers? Um, how do we think about self-reliance? Uh, at the scale of a state and a city and a community. <clears throat> and so there are a lot of challenges ahead, as you might imagine, as we do this. Uh, I'm just going to roll these up on screen. You can read them as we go. Um, but I want to say something about the scope three emissions. Um, this chart shows you the greenhouse gas emissions um, United States, Bay Area, Santa Clara County, and Palo Alto. Scope three emissions are the emissions from the things that we purchase. Scope one is stuff that we burn, so like natural gas, water heater, that's a scope one emission. Scope two is the electricity where you're inducing consumption somewhere else that produces emissions. Scope three is the stuff that we buy. Cars, <coughs> air travel, steaks and hamburgers and tofu and what have you, big screen TVs, computers, Everything that you buy has an impact. We're, we don't measure it in a formal way. We're not required to report it under the greenhouse gas protocols. But if you think about it, this is the piece that we've been reporting. This. This is our actual impact. It's about three times what we report. And it's something that city government has no control over. You do. So what do we do with that? How do we start to bring that down? We have a big challenge there because it's a very prosperous community. We have lots of money and we spend money on all kinds of cool stuff. And every dollar that we spend, like I said, is a vote for a future. So how do we spend? How do we invest? What impact does it have? Where do we want to go? So let me kind of close with a few questions that I'd like you to think about both tonight and when you leave here today. Um, and the fundamental one is what might be possible. Not what we know for sure is possible, but what might be possible. Could we be the first city that actually thrives on ambient resources? You know, a car-free city may seem like a distant goal, but how can we start to move in that direction? Um, Cost-effectiveness is essential, but how can we move beyond the limits of tools that don't do cost-effectiveness cost -effectiveness analysis right? We have some requirements from the state that box us into what we think are the wrong decisions. We can't change, we can't do anything with that until the state changes the rules. And we're working with them to try to get that done. Uh, how do we design better systems, not just pieces of systems, but better integrated systems? And what can you do, you know, as a citizen, as a neighbor, as an investor, and as a voter? Um, and this is very challenging because it asks each of us to change the way that we do things, to change our habits. How many of you have ever tried to change a habit? <laughs> yeah, okay, you know, we've all done that. We're sometimes successful and sometimes not. How many of you have ever tried to change a spouse's habits? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, so take that, and so I'm, I'm charged with changing the habits of a thousand people in an organization. You know, Hewlett Packard is trying to change the habits of several hundred thousand people in an organization. Here in the Bay Area, we've got to change the habits of seven million people in an organization. It can be done. There's a wonderful book by Charles Duhigg about the, the power of habit and, you know, clear method for how you do it. And that's one of the challenges that we have. 
Beyond that, though, bigger than that, and this is probably new to most of you, is that do you know that we have goals as a planet? Mm-hmm. These are the global goals, sometimes called the Sustainable Development Goals. These have been adopted by 193 countries around the world. This is, this is the game on in cities in Europe. Cities in the U.S. don't know anything about it. Uh, growing number of major corporations around the world are orienting business strategies around this. And you can see some of the things brought here. This is, you know, this is a broad agenda about the kind of world we want to live in. No poverty as a global goal. No hunger, not less hunger, no hunger. You know, we got a billion people going to bed hungry every night on this planet. That's actually progress. When I was a kid, it was a billion people out of three billion. It's now a billion people out of seven billion. That's better, but it's still terrible. So this is the framework that increasingly the planet is organizing around that I invite you to get familiar with and look at what does this mean for you in your life, in your neighborhood. Um, Some of you are familiar with the cool block program that we've been piloting that brings people, neighbors together on a block by block basis to work cooperatively on these goals. Um, You may be working a business or own a business or belong to a faith community. Uh, or have other ways that you interact with other people, how can this start to surface in the conversation? Because the goal for me is one that I learned from my mentor, Buckminster Fuller, 26 years ago. Bucky oriented his life around a world that works for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. That, for me, has been the beacon for my adult life and all the work that I've done in government and in business and in community and in NGOs. Um, And it's a high bar, but it's a really clarifying high bar. It lets us ask the question at every moment, am I contributing to that or not? Am I moving toward that or away from that? And lest this seem really far out and fanciful, I'd like to close with a quote that I just learned for the first time a couple weeks ago from a writer named Adrian Marie Brown who said, all organizing is science fiction. I go, what are you saying? Well, she said, all organizing is science fiction and intrinsically spiritual. Because we have faith that we can build a world that we've never experienced. So, thank you. try and like implement measures such as no car zones instead of trying to encourage people to buy electric vehicles first because that would uh, increase public transportation and also reduce um, fossil fuel cars. It's, it's, it's a great question. I think we're going to probably try to do both. Because uh, yeah, we could, you know, in theory, for example, we could close off the University Avenue and car zones. <laughs> But, but there are still people who have to get places that are not walkable. Uh, we still have people you know, commuting 30 minutes or two hours to come to work here. So um, we really have to you know, try good ideas like no car zones, but also think about how do we meet people where they are and meet the needs that people have today. And that's why you know, the design brief for me around, around transportation is how do we make it more convenient for anybody anywhere at any time to not have to get into a car and drive. Mm-hmm. That's going to be different things for different people. I assume that you're in school, you go to school every day, maybe you bike to school, um, maybe not. <laughs> 44% of our high school students bike to school. That's amazing statistics. It's really terrific. I'm going to be proud of it. But not everybody can do that. Maybe you live too far away. Uh, maybe you can't bike for some reason. Um, maybe you can take a bus to work, but what if you have two jobs and they're far apart from each other? What if you have a job and then you've got to go care for an aging relative in some other place? Or what if you don't have a job and you coach soccer after school and you've got to get all these soccer balls and gear somewhere you can't carry on the bus? So different people have different needs. And we have to be flexible to that. And that's why I ask the question, how do we develop a system that lets everybody, with all their different needs, have the option of not driving? And for some, it's going to be, you know, I live near my work, I can walk to work, I love a pedestrian, you know, pedestrian zone for businesses. It's a really interesting suggestion. Let me say one more thing about this. In my experience, every city that has experimented with this, the idea has come up 
And the first reaction from the merchants, from the shopkeepers, and the restaurants and so forth is, no, I'm opposed, this will kill my business, because people won't be able to get to my business. And there's a bunch of political debate, and sometimes it doesn't succeed, and sometimes it does. And where it does succeed, a year later, the merchants say, this was the best thing that ever happened in my business. <laughs> so. Two questions. On your diagram, you had an electric vehicle bubble and a mobility bubble. First question is, why are those separate rather than one bubble? And then, do you have any thoughts about uh, jet fuel uh, reduction? Sure. Um, they're, they're separate because I mean, they're closely related, obviously, but they're two different things. Electric vehicles is about how to reduce the carbon emissions of the car of the vehicles that we use. So that goes to things like making sure there's sufficient electric charging infrastructure in the city so that people can actually recharge their cars. Uh, that goes to increasing the EV concentration in the city fleet, both for our service vehicles and eventually for our police vehicles and others. Um, the mobility issue plays out differently. It's not so much a technology question as a service design question. Uh, what are the service offerings? So you know, Lyft and Uber have come up as, as you know, great examples of a more flexible approach to getting people around about their cars. Chariot in San Francisco became a mini bus service. Um, uh, you know, 12 passenger vans on flexible routes. In, in Helsinki, in fact, they have a, a, a shuttle system uh, where they basically merge the bus system and Uber and Lyft. So the shuttle has a defined route, but if you ping it with your phone, it will veer off its route and come get you. And constantly optimizing its route, again, getting the most efficient capital utilization so we get more back for our buck. So they're related, but they're you know, and complementary, but different in terms of the moves we need to make, the things we need to think about, who we need to engage in them. But all, you know, all these connect, and uh, it's, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's just not, it doesn't work for us to say everything's connected. We have to take some discrete actions on specific issues. That's why. Uh, it needs to be understandable to the community, it needs to make sense to council, it needs to make sense to the department so that people actually do it. Uh, jet fuel. Um, is a big challenge. Uh, there, there is, is uh, growing work on using biofuels and jet fuel. United out, out of LA, I think, has uh, somebody helping maybe 10 or 20 percent of their fuel there, I believe, is biofuel. Uh, there's early experimentation with electric powered aircraft. Still young, ranges are not great. You're seeing that. Uh, and so, um, as with all the other things we're talking about, there's the technological shift solution. Then there's a the question of why do you fly? When do you fly? Do you need to fly? Do you want to fly? Um, we had a client years ago in my in, in natural logic, my consultancy. Um, we were on the West Coast, client was on the East Coast. They said, we want to do an initial meeting. Can you guys fly your team out for a half a day to have a chartering meeting with us? And we said, no. <laughs> We'd love to work with you, but we're not going to do that. How about a video conference? And they said, oh, hadn't thought about that. We did that. It was terrific. And then, you know, a month later, we all came out for two days of face-to-face -face work of the sort that you can't do over a video conference, but thinking about what's the right tool for the job, what's the actual need you have, is part of the story. Um, you know, I think that when we look at our scope three footprint, uh, jet travel is going to be pretty darn high for this community, and it's something you need to think about. Now, high-speed rail could be a solution to that. To get it. High-speed rail is, is, is part of the solution, and it's coming, although it's coming slowly. Uh, if any of you travel in Europe, I just got back from a week in Vienna, you, you know the remarkable difference in the rail systems there compared to ours. We're, you know, we're running about 50 or 80 years behind the rest of the world on rail. So you know, hopefully we catch up a bit there. Yeah. Right here. Thank you have a great presentation. Uh, when you look for motivation or, or mottos in other cities, large or small, in California, the U.S., or around the world, which ones come to mind, and can you identify any unique things that are already doing? Sure. Um, the good news is that there's a lot. There's innovation all over the place. We're members of a thing called the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Uh, this is 170 or 175 North American cities who have somebody like me uh, in the city government. It ranges from you know Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Vancouver to Sioux Falls, Iowa, um, and uh, you know, towns of 15,000 people all across the spectrum. What's been and, and so we are a a peer-to-peer -peer learning network. We share what we do. We share what we learn. We help each other out on issues. 
And remarkably, we all have things to learn from each other. We're, we are very good at certain things. We're not very good at other things, and some other cities are. And so you have, oh gosh, you know, Chicago's been a leader on green buildings and green roofs. Los Angeles now is moving very rapidly on redesigning their entire transportation system, moving from a car-based city to a transit-based city. Remarkable plans that are underway there. Um, New York City has done phenomenal stuff about social engagement and community engagement. Um, Copenhagen, uh, you know, people are riding bicycles in the snow in the winter, <laughs> commuting to work. Uh, you know, like there's traffic jams of bicycles during rush hours in Copenhagen. Uh, so yeah, there's, you know, there's a whole host of examples around the world. Uh, London, congestion pricing. Uh, um, um, with carbon neutral cities and lines, 20 cities that have set a carbon neutral goal um, are looking at financing issues. Uh, one of the things we did last, last, last year, the year before last year, together with USDM, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, is build a municipal financing toolkit. We surveyed the field and identified 40 distinct financial, financial measures that cities can take besides taxes and bonds, the obvious one, in order to forward sustainability agendas. Uh, so that was a shared work product. You know, 20 different cities contributed to it. 180 cities are now using it. Uh, so um, you know, so there's there's tons of examples, and I think the main point of, of, of the answer to your question is that there is innovation happening all over the world at a phenomenal scale. Uh, uh, surprisingly, a lot in China, which we tend not to think about here. Um, you may have seen the story a week or two ago about China sending out 60,000 soldiers to plant millions of trees, but that's the least of it for them. Uh, their plans are to be out of coal by 2030. We'll see if they succeed or not, but that's the plan. And the, the story that hardly anybody knows in the United States is that the national level, the central committee level, China has established a strategy for what they call ecological civilization. Huh? All the stuff that we're talking about renewable, closed system, circular, ambient energy, and so forth, national policy for the biggest country in the world, the country that will be the largest economy in the world in this century. Um, and you know, one of the challenges for us in the political leadership that we're facing now in Washington is that we are giving away the future to Chinese leadership. Now, I don't say that to be jingoistic or anti-China, but we have been the innovators for much of the global economy for a long time. We're going to abdicate that, and they're going to pick up the ball. Now, I don't blame them. They should do that, and they will do that. And you know, the question is just, do we want to drop it or be in the game? So back over there. So I just want to really encourage people that education really helps make the um, adopting of, of new vehicles uh, easier. Thank you for that. And, and the example you gave of the ride device points out that education isn't just giving you information. It's about giving you an experience of an alternative you might not have seen before. We did ride and drives at City Hall last year. Uh, and among the riders were some folks from our police department who came out saying, yeah, let me check out these dinky, underpowered, boring, <laughs> stupid electric vehicles. And they came out with big grins on their faces. And these are really cool. And they're happy. And I can imagine using them in my work. And maybe I, maybe if I can't get a police cruiser yet, maybe I'll get one from my home. 10 minutes, butts in seats, driving around the block, transformation of perception. So any chance you get to give people the taste of what you've already experienced, some of you know Sven Thiessen, who's got a zero net energy home in Palo Alto. He opens his home all the time, brings in tours, have people come and see what it's actually like to live in these things. And people say, this is not hair shirt environmentalism. This is not suffering for the sake of the mother. This is living a good life in a way that's efficient and economical and fun and convivial. And so giving the taste is something that all of us can do. Uh, one of the first conversations I had with Jim Keen, I was, started, I was talking with him about the scope three emissions that I talked with you guys about. And Jim's a funny guy, I don't know you know him personally. But he, he clutched his coffee cup to his breast and said, you're not taking away my latte, man, are you? <laughs> it's great. I said, no, no, I'm not going to take away your latte. I'm not going to take away anybody's anything. I'm not in favor of draconian environmentalism. I said, but what I am going to do, Jim, is I'm going to tell you how much your latte really costs. Trusting that in a community like this filled with really, really smart people who care about this stuff, 
once you know what your latte costs, you're never going to forget that. And you're going to think about that every time you buy one, and maybe you'll buy something different next time. I mean, latte is not the right example, but you get the point. It's like, you know, if we think about what every dollar we spend really does in the world and how it relates to the things that we really care about in our own hearts and about our families, we start to make different choices. So taxes may be clear information, I think is, is, is equally powerful. Thank you, Neil, so much for um, your talk tonight. So Palo Alto has been a great leader in a variety of things. And then we have the flip side where our city council is supporting building garages, they're fighting the legislation to do more affordable housing next to transit centers. We have these two sides here. How do we, uh, as you were saying earlier, educate and inspire? Because right now I'm seeing that the change, that climate change is happening faster than our governments can actually move forward. Yeah. And so some real answers for that a lot of um, how do we really want to have to have a lot of questions would be preferable. Yeah. Thank well, you so much. Yeah. Um, those are real concerns you know, the answers. You know, I gave the example of China where you've got a central committee that makes a decision to a democracy. You know, we elect these people. We lobby them. We talk to them a lot and we know them personally. Uh, it all comes down to the conversations that we have with each other. And I know that's frustrating because it's not like you have a conversation and you get your way immediately, any more than you do in a marriage. You know, or with your kids. This is like patient explaining over and over again. Uh, but I think the key is that, you know, and, and I, I've been saying we either here to say you because I don't live in this community. I don't elect the electeds here. You do. And so this is really, it's easy to say they're screwing up, but in fact, it's on all of us, all of you, of the kind of conversations we have with each other, the kind of conversations we have with the electeds, who runs for office, who votes for who goes into office, and you know, it's not like a magic bullet right say we fix this tomorrow, but that's where it's gotta happen. Yeah, there's a mix, there's a mixed bag. We're good in some things and not others, like every other city. Uh, and the question is, how do we move that? You know, you talk about the example of parking garages. I know there was a meeting at Finance Committee last night about that. This is a real challenging question, and it's partly about convenience in Calab and other areas where people feel there's not enough parking now, but it's partly a question of what is the kind of city we want to have, what's an effective use of taxpayers' money, what gets us the best result per dollar, what are the results that we want to have? Do we have any consensus about any of the elements there? My suspicion, and I've seen this in community after community around the country, <clears throat> is that even where there are powerful disagreements, there are things that people agree about. Uh, and I've seen people go you know, run remarkable processes that bring communities that are almost at war with each other, lawyering up, and about to go, you know, go into battle with each other, finding common ground and inventing new solutions they couldn't have found otherwise. Now, easier to say that than to do that. Um, but that's some of what's going to have to happen here to find the solutions to the kind of questions that you're raising. It's, you, you, know, you either out-organize people and win by political force, which is one way to go, or you find a way to forge a new consensus and win that way. Um, one, one more question, and then I have a few last okay, now. So announcements. right over here, then, right behind you. <laughs> I, actually, I grew up in Los Altos, but I now live near Seattle, and um, Seattle is known as a very green city, but I've heard on some of the local NPR stations that they do have a climate action plan, but they're not actually following through with it, so I was wondering, what actually keeps you or the city of Palo Alto and others accountable, you know, what happens if they don't meet their goals because a lot our new the new Seattle mayor has touted we are going to be the leader and this whole podcast is about it's not happening. Well, um, I mean, the only way I know how to answer that question is that what keeps us accountable is you. Yeah, you know, if we don't do what we say we're going to do, if we don't do what we're trying to do here, kick our butts. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else to say. Uh, you know, we will. We're going to try and we're going to fail in a whole bunch of ways. 
Uh, some of them will be through fear, you know, lack of focus and courage and determination. Some of it's going to be just because they're making mistakes. Some of it's going to be because events go the way they do. Um, but if you don't think we're doing the right things, you're doing a good job, make your voice known. Um, you know, this is a, I said at the top of the talk, this is a you know, bureaucracy democracy combination. It's a difficult combination. You know, on the one hand, you can get, you can speak. You can go to any city council meeting and get the mic. Anytime you can get appointments with council, which on the other hand, it's a bureaucracy that is sluggish and you know compartmentalized and sometimes a little dumb and often very often slower than I would like. But that's the process that we have to work with. So you know, um, I, I think if there's one thing I'd like you to leave here is not thinking, oh, isn't Gil Grady's done all this cool stuff, city government? Yay! It's like this is the community that makes it happen. You know. You guys elected the city council to hire Jim Keen, who hired me, who hired the department directors who have moved forward. And there's, you know, it's not just, this didn't start 50 months ago when I came here. I came in and one of the first things I did was a survey of sustainability initiatives across city government. And we had done it. There were 154 projects that we could find. This came out of the normal operations of the department. So there's good resource there. There's good potential. Um, keep the pressure on. Let your voice be heard. Let people know what you want. You know, things like the debates over housing or the parking garages or what have you. Um, council needs to hear from you. You know, they're not going to necessarily do exactly what you say, but the general momentum and preponderance of public opinion does have an impact. So organize and make your voices heard. Um, now, I will say that to other communities too. I'll say that the people who disagree with me, because that's the way that's the way this game works. Is that whatever you care about, speak up about it. Find people who share your views, make your voice heard. That's where change happens. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it, thank you.